is Histories and Mysteries Uncovered. I'm Ashley. And I'm Jessica. And on this week's episode, Ashley is going to be talking about the... Oh, about... (laughs) (laughs) She's going to be talking about Ding Dong Ditch Gone Wrong. And I am going to be telling some near-death experience stories. Ooh, I'm very excited. I love near-death experiences. I think it's so interesting and just the way it like changes people's perspectives you know yeah yeah exactly and we're recording this episode a few weeks out yeah because Ashley's terrible at planning yes I'm going on vacation I'm leaving tomorrow and I told Jessica like last week I was like oh by the way by the way we need to record four episodes in a week (laughs) because we had to record our bonus episode too oh my gosh um so July 19th, which is obviously prior to this episode coming out, we are in a magazine. Oh, yeah. It, it got came out released today? today. Oh. Yep. yep. That's exciting. Yeah. So check it out. It's called Women Who Podcast Magazine. Yep. We'll uh, link it in our socials and everything. And uh, check us out. We got interviewed like Big time people interview guys. I know it's so exciting. <laughs> so yeah, we're super pumped for it. And yeah, we can't wait for you guys to read it. And just a reminder that our contest is still going on. Yeah. So check out that. It's all over our social media. But basically, if you uh share or tag three friends in any of our social media posts, rate or review us, or join our Patreon, you get entries into a, a, a bucket, and we're going to pull for prizes. Mm-hmm. So try that out. And if not, if you don't want to do it, join our Patreon. It's fun over there. We will be releasing our second bonus episode at the end of this month. It is a, it's a good time. It's a good time. It's super exciting. So yeah. big things are happening. We're, we're moving on up in the podcasting world, hopefully. Super exciting. <laughs> yeah. All right. So my case is going to make everyone here rage. Uh, it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And it also made me cry. So so I got all my information from Lawn Crime, New York Times, Hindustan Times, The Press Enterprise, and Remember the Three. Okay. Okay. Ding dong ditch. It's a rite of passage for most kids. You ring a doorbell and you run and you giggle. Super harmless, fun for kids. For some reason, I never got it. I never did it. Doesn't seem fun to me, but kids love it. They think it's hilarious. Did you ever ding dong ditch? No. Me neither. I was a good kid. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I feel like of all the things kids can be doing, ding dong ditch, pretty harmless, right? Yeah. Uh, I would be super annoyed, however, if someone ding dong ditched me because my dogs would go nuts and my kids might be sleeping and I'd be like, ugh. but I'd roll my eyes and move on. I'm just an old person. I'd be like, get off my lawn. Get off my lawn, kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, that the rolling of the eyes or yelling, get off my lawn should have been how the night went for uh-huh. 16-year-old Jacob Ivascu, Drake Ruiz, Daniel Hawkins, 18-year-old Sergio Camposano, and two other boys who were 13 and 14. They didn't release their names because they're minors. I'm assuming, I don't know this for sure, but I'm assuming the 13 and 14-year-old were probably younger brothers um, because probably. the other kids were 18 and 16. Yeah, this I, I can already see where this is going. So the night that night, the boys were all having a sleepover um, and sorry, there was an um, (laughs) you've had a few already. Oh, no. Okay, I'm going to pay attention. I'm doing it. (laughs) They were having a sleepover and one of the boys dared another boy to do a ding dong ditch. I wrote doorbell ditch. That's not a thing. So (laughs) they all got in the car, drove to a nearby house And according to one of the boys' moms, they thought that that house belonged to another teenager that they knew. The boy ran up, rang the doorbell, and ran back to his car. Unfortunately, that was not where the story ends. Mm. The house that they rang the doorbell of belonged to Anurag Chandra. And he admitted at this point that he had had about 12 beers. 
oh my god how is he not dead <laughs> right i'd be just oh he's probably just <laughs> drinking Coors Light he was drinking Corona premium oh uh, because I was gonna say Coors Light is like just water <laughs> <laughs> I used to drink Bud Light, uh, but I'm not a huge fan of beer anymore. I like a, a good sour, a good sour beer. Mm. Mm. That's my jam. I'm into wine now and oh. hard liquor. <laughs> 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 Just into hard liquor, drinking whiskey, smoking my cigs. <laughs> With my dirt stash. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so Anurag said that the boy had a sweatshirt on with a hood over his head, came up, rang the doorbell, flashed his butt, and then got back in the car. Anyway, even if flashed he flashed his butt, butt. Or yeah, like pulled his pants down, I was like, Nee-nee. he mooned him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mooned him. But they said flashed his butt, so that's what I put. <laughs> but yes, mooned them. It's hilarious, <laughs> right? It's funny. It's cute. It's like, oh my god. Okay. But Anurag said that he feared for his wife and daughter who were home and that the incident made him, quote, extremely, extremely mad. Oh, so I was going to say, if it made him feel uncomfortable, maybe he thought it was black eyed kid. Whew. Speaking of which, did you hear about that girl who went missing? Um, she called 911. She called 911 to say that she saw a toddler walking down the road, like down the expressway, and she stopped to help him or her. I don't know what the toddler was and got out, called a family member. They were on the phone with her. She was talking about how she's going to help this toddler. She screamed and then they couldn't find her. What? Yeah. So then they heard nothing on the phone and she went missing. Her name is Carly Nicole Russell. And then all of a sudden, a couple of days later, she just showed up at her house. What? Yeah. And they took her to the hospital and they haven't released any more information about it. Some people are saying it's like a mental health issue, but someone did mention like, what if it was a black eyed kid? Yeah. It's a yeah. good possibility. So, right. creepy. <laughs> so Anurag decided, you know, this made him extremely, extremely mad. So he decided to sit back, sit back down and take a deep breath until he calmed down and then continued on with his night. Not. That's not what happened. Anurag hopped in his car and pursued the boys. He was rear-ending and side-swiping their car uh, until he finally forced them to stop. They made a U-turn trying to escape, but Anurag pursued them. Police said that Anurag reached speeds of 99 miles per hour or 159 kilometers per hour for our Canadian before ramming his car into the back of the boys where it veered off the road and collided with a tree and a utility <gasps> boy or utility boy utility pole what yeah he then felt really bad and stopped to render aid and call 911 really no he drove off <laughs> he actually the police said that he drove back and forth to view the scene for enjoyment <gasps> he said his quote was that he drove off he didn't think that the boys had been injured at the scene the driver sergio said that he quote whipped into my window and i blacked out and then i remember i woke up on the floor i don't remember how i got there i was shaking unfortunately jacob Vasco died at the scene <sighs> And Drake Ruiz and Daniel Hawkins died at the hospital. And oh. the three others were pretty severely injured, some ranging from like minor to major. Again, they did not release any information on the 13 and 14 year old boys. Boys, They are alive. That's all we know. Just little babes. Yeah. And I tried to find more information about the boy's point of view and like what happened in the car and the car accident and any of that stuff, but they just didn't, I think the boys were young, so they didn't want to push it, you know, but at trial, Anurag said that he feared for his family and that he had just followed the teens to his express his anger, and he never intended to strike his car, but then they break suddenly and he hit them. That's why you're going that fast. Yeah. 
He said, you know, their car sideswiped my car. And then because they hit the brakes, I, I didn't think it was my fault. So I just went home. But you went back and forth. That's what prosecution said. So prosecution yeah. called in a crash reconstruction expert who testified that Anurag had intentionally rammed the boys and that he had driven back and forth past the accident scene for enjoyment. Anurag also testified that he very rarely drank, but that night he had consumed 12 bottles of Corona premium between the time of 7.30 and 10 p.m., but claimed that he was still driving under control and even used his turn signals, Jessica. So I just really enjoy that he has to mention that he had 12 beers and he really thought that that was going to help his case. Yeah, because he's like, oh, I, I I had 12 beers, but like I was still driving in control. Like I was contr in control of myself. You just admitted that you rarely drink and you had 12 beers between in two and a half hours. Oh, gross. Yeah. I barely drink one in an hour. Yeah. He had like six beers Ooh. an hour. Like he had to be That's hugging awful. them. Yeah. yeah. Something was clearly like bugging him that day. Yeah. Anurag testified that he arrived home as his wife was taking out the garbage can. She asked about the damage to their car and he said that he responded. He didn't want to talk about it and he would take care of things later. Now, I saw two different stories and I'm not sure which is the correct one. One said that police found Anurag's front license plate at the scene. Another one said that a witness saw what happened and followed Anurag home so that they could report who he was to the police. I'm not sure how the police, which one the police found out, but the police found out who he was. But like, wouldn't the boys have been able to tell him, like tell them? Well, I think at this point they were probably in the hospital and like three of them had passed and they were yeah. Yeah, getting treatment and stuff like that. But so one of the stories was that they found Anurag's license plate at the scene and then they arrived at his house a little after 11. They knocked on the door and shined their flashlights, but he didn't answer. He was asleep and said he had passed out from the, quote, overwhelming stress. Not the, like, overwhelming amounts of alcohol in your system? Yeah. At about 2 p.m., he woke up and called 911 to report suspicious people outside his home. He didn't tell the dispatcher about the collision, but the dispatcher was like, uh, dude, those are the police outside your house. And he is like, why are the police officers at my door? Excuse me? What? <laughs> Anurag was arrested and charged with three three counts of first-degree murder and three counts of attempted murder uh, with a sentence enhancement of great bodily injury. He, thankfully, was found guilty and got three life sentences without the possibility of parole. Oh, wow. His attorney said that the conviction is a complete overreach and that he plans to file a motion for a new trial. He said, quote, I think we felt worst case scenario would be voluntary manslaughter, but we also thought he had made a great case for acquittal outright. The battle has just begun as far as I'm concerned. Was he not charged with drinking and driving? Um, they didn't say that. Maybe yeah. because they didn't have technically proof, so they couldn't Maybe. charge him with it, you know, because they didn't take like any blood alcohol levels from him or whatever. If they did, it was well past because it was 2 a.m. at that point. Yeah. But what I don't get is his attorney thinking that it was a complete overreach and that he would get voluntary manslaughter. Yeah, like, that makes no sense. I get the first degree because... No, he didn't sit there thinking about it as house. Like first, for those of you, first degree means it's premeditated. And he had time to get in his car, follow these boys, and then decide to chase them down, follow them around and ram them. I don't think that's manslaughter. He had the, the intent to do harm. Yeah. Ugh, it made me so mad. So the reason why I cried... <laughs> Is because the website, Remember the Three, is about the three boys who passed. And on the website, they have their eulogies, which I'm going to read. They're not long. And then they also had, like, remembrance videos. And they showed them from, like, when they were babies and, like, oh. to music and growing up. And it just broke my heart. 
I can't do that. Like I, I had to stop. I couldn't watch it. I watched like the first two seconds of it and I was like, no, I can't. Yeah. Kyle and I are watching Criminal Minds from the beginning. Oh, I love that show. And anytime the episode with the kid like with kids comes on mm-hmm. and kids are involved, we're like, mm, <laughs> maybe not not this episode. Yeah. Yeah. It's because uh, we watched a couple, there was like two in a row. It was horrible. Uh, yeah. And him and I were both sitting there and we're like almost in tears. Yeah. Because we just think of our little girl. Like, it's, it's so hard. Awful. I, this is the stupidest one I've ever cried over. Okay. So, and I think I may have mentioned it on here before, but I think I was pregnant at the time. We had had Oliver. I think I was pregnant with Mara. So keep that in mind that there were hormones. We watched Superman and the scene where Superman's parents have to put their yeah. baby in the thing to let it go to a land that they don't even know because they're going to die. I bawled. <laughs> I mean, if it makes you feel any better, I, I cry at that scene every time I watch it. And I'm okay, not it's not just me then. <laughs> <laughs> I cry at happy scenes. like. <laughs> well, and I'm not a crier. Oh, um, I am. But... Totally, yeah. <laughs> It's so funny. I, I'm not a crier unless it has to do with kids or animals. Then I'll cry. But like in real life, I don't cry a lot unless I'm really, really mad. I'm a mad crier, which makes me more mad because then I'm crying because I'm mad. I want to be tough, not cry. Loser. I know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. So Drake Ruiz said this was his eulogy. Drake was born in Newport Beach, California to Billy and Debbie Ruiz. Drake was an amazing kid. He always kept us laughing. He could always make a joke and then dish on back. He was an insanely spirited young man who will always be remembered. Drake loved the ocean and never wanted to leave the water. He loved going to movies, mostly comedies. He always wanted to play football or rugby with his friends and prove he was stronger than them. He loved God and wasn't ashamed of his faith. Drake had two half siblings in Texas, Chelsea and Austin. His younger brother, Caleb, lived with him and several kids. He called his brothers and sisters lived with him at various times. He had one set of grandparents who recently moved in with him and when he was getting to know them better, he will be missed. These boys were like these three 16 year olds were like best friends. They had met in, uh, I think elementary school and they were both, or all three of them were very involved in the church. They were very religious kids and they were like inseparable. Daniel Hawkins. Daniel is survived by his immediate family, mother and father, Janet and Craig Craig Hawkins, sister, Sarah Hawkins and brother, Joshua Hawkins. Daniel was filled with a love for life and adventure. He lived life large. He loved the beach, playing football, and yes, video games. He was athletically gifted, energetic, driven, well, except for doing chores in his school homework, vibrant, very inquisitive, and yet with all this, simply put, funny. It was difficult to be around Daniel for any length of time and not have him bring a smile to your face. He could bring joy to your soul through his athletic abilities, his friendly personality, or his sense of humor. Daniel celebrated life. He often made the simplest tasks entertaining. He loved to explore. He would even go hiking by himself just to see what was there. Nonetheless, he loved being with people, especially his closest friends. While Daniel was often lighthearted, he would also wrestle with deep questions such as ethical dilemmas. He had a sharp mind and was enjoyable to watch him engage in every sense. He had a wonderful life. In short, Daniel was delightful. We had the joy of having him for 16 years. Daniel loved God, life, sports, and his friends and family. The world is a poorer place without him. We will greatly miss him. Yet we know one day we will be united with him in heaven through our trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord Savior. And then the last one, Jacob Ivascu. God brought Jacob into this world on January 13th, 2004 at 8.13 a.m. To say that our son was a gentle soul would be an understatement. Even from a young age, he was blessed with a kind heart and was sensitive to others around him, easy to trust and confide in. He made you feel as if you were his best friend. Those who had the opportunity to direct his path, his aunties, uncles, and grandparents and teachers all loved him and felt that he if, felt as if he were their son. It was downright difficult to punish him because he was quick to repent and negotiate his way out of most situations. He was naturally funny and knew how to tell a story. Jacob embraced life with childlike joy, and his beautiful smile will forever be etched in the hearts of so many. Although his life was brief, it was complete. He was privileged to attend the best schools, and he did not take that opportunity for granted, always striving to achieve his goals. We, as his parents, frequently reminded him 
that his intelligent mind was a gift from the Lord and what he would choose to do with it was entirely up to him. Jacob always thought of the needs of others, especially his friends, and was eager to include them in our family trips, invite them to our house, and share his numerous blessings. He loved to explore. As a young boy, was fascinated by the sky, the mountains, and the beaches, and thankfully he experienced it all. In our home, he was deeply loved by all of his minions, younger siblings, who were all easily and willingly under his control. He (laughs) set the pace was a great example and was the peacemaker when they would annoy each other as five siblings often do. What we want everyone to know about our son, Jacob, above all, is that he loved the Lord with all of his heart. Our prayer for our children was always that they would be the light in the dark and dismal world. And he was. Jacob is leaving behind a legacy that we could not be more thankful for. And he was a son we could not be more proud of. That's so nice. I know. And then a few weeks after his death, Jacob's mom found a picture of a dove that he had painted for her and planned to give her on Mother's Day. She said, quote, he never painted things for me before, and I never saw it until a few weeks after he passed away. He painted a picture of a dove with a wing pointed up to heaven and wrote the words peace. And if you see this picture, it's phenomenal. He wanted to give it to me for Mother's Day, but never had the chance to finish it. There is also a scholarship fund in the boys' names for boys that go to the school that they went to. So sweet, isn't it? And it's just, I think what makes me so mad about this is it's so senseless. It's so senseless. Yeah, like it's not like they came to your front door with a gun. Yeah, they were just doing ding dong. Di- I mean, how many kids in this world do ding dong ditch and like, can I like ask got killed. how, like, what race was everybody? Uh, all of the boys were white oh. and Anurag was Indian. That's interesting. And maybe that the fear did play a little bit more into it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's, it still doesn't justify, right. Right. but if you take a look at it from those yeah. angles. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. So hopefully your story is a bit more uplifting. Um, no. Oh, My okay. stories are not uplifting. They're near death experiences, you donkey. Well, I know, but I thought maybe they'd be like, and because of my near death experience, I learned to appreciate life. And I'm now, you know, the 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 grand marshal of loving and hope. I don't think they go into that. So okay, (laughs) okay. (laughs) This is from you slash Bergrider. Nice Bergrider. I don't know. His usernames are whacked. (laughs) This happened during my undergrad school. Me and a couple of my other friends visited this friend's home. There was a hill near this house, and we decided to hike up it to watch the sunset. To reach this hill, you have to pass a railway line, and that particular day, there was a goods train, which had been parked there for some reason. So we had to crawl in between the bogies to cross the track, as well, um, as usual, we were late when we left the house, so the sunset was almost down and it was getting darker. And we had to climb the joint coupling in between the bogies and cross it. I think bogies are like the train cars. This this guy knows a lot about trains. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, here we go. This You were right. I, for one, was overexcited to see a goods train and wanted to get inside one of the bogies, <laughs> which was open from the top. <laughs> I I as well enjoy a goods train. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I climbed up the bogey and then raised my hands, standing on the edge of it as if I achieved something. Oh, no, honey. And then I felt something weird on my forearms, like I was touching some spider web. <gasps> I was actually in the field of a high tension electric line. <gasps> If I had raised my hand even a centimeter more, I would have been pulled into the field completely and would have been instantly burned alive. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, So that's horrible. Horrifying. 
That's, oh my gosh. Yeah. This one is from Psychological Bed 751. Always listen to your gut, even if you can't completely logically back up your reasons. Recently, we were traveling all over Costa Rica. We love nature, but we fear and respect it. <laughs> That's a good place to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we knew there were crocs on the west side of the Bahia Balena and talked to locals when we travel about local dangers. Often it was snakes. So we get to the East Caribbean side to Playa Negra. We set up shop on the beach near a ravine. And I keep looking at this ravine. I know that crocs can look like logs <laughs> and they are still until they attack. I keep staring and can't see anything. So I keep trying to reassure myself. We have a toddler and I tell her to stay away. Oh God! I tell my husband my feelings. We are hyper aware at this point. I just can't calm myself, so I pull up my phone to ask the internet if there are even crocs in this area. Internet says one hasn't been spotted for nearly 10 years. I go on my Facebook group. I don't trust that internet <laughs> based on this story you're telling. I go on one of my Facebook groups and everyone says no, not the area for it. It only happens in extreme drought. Still. I couldn't calm down, so I told my family I was sorry and didn't want to ruin a beach day, but we can't stay here. We left and just decided to do a different activity. Two days later, we were at a restaurant, and it was all over the news that a little kid, about eight years old, got attacked by a croc at the beach. Oh, God. I almost vomited watching it. I can't tell you if it was the exact spot since it's a good sized beach, but I don't care. It could have been my family. Wow. Someone was looking over her. I yeah. I feel that way. Yep. Which is crazy. Like, imagine if that was you. No. <laughs> this is why we need to trust our guts, people. Yes. When we lived in South Carolina, I always wanted to go tubing down the river, but my husband would never go with me because he's like, there's crocodiles. I'm not going. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I finally got him to go tubing here because there's no crocodiles. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I could not even imagine. Mm -mm. This next one is from Familiar Ostrich 537. Ooh. <laughs> Speaking of which, <laughs> one, of our, one of our listeners wrote in, Ashley, saying that there's some, what, Emu. ostrich? Emu. Emu. So if you guys remember, Jessica did the Great Emu War. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently the there's what's what she says going on i don't know it's something in alaska uh here uh it's the great alaskan emu hunt of 2023 and then it's uh from the alaska bird club <laughs> it says does anyone know who in anchorage keeps emus because Alaska Police Department dispatch just had someone call in saying there are some loose ones on Tudor Road. Related. Does anyone know how to catch an emu in case they <laughs> ask us for help? <laughs> so that's happening in Alaska. <laughs> I, I've always wanted to go to Alaska. I, Me whew. too. Everybody uh, yeah. who's been says it's beautiful. Yeah, I, I would really love to go. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, moving along. Yeah. Familiar ostrich, 537. <laughs> <laughs> I was a grown-ass adult just trying to get my exercise in during a super hot Florida summer. So I was out walking by myself after midnight. It's a super small community and it would be rare to come across another person. A truck passed by me slowly and close enough to see two sketchy looking guys in it. Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay. You okay? I, I accidentally clicked a button on my mouse and it got oh. out of my page. <laughs> <laughs> they turned the corner and I saw the headlight beam slow to a stop, do a U-turn, and head back. I had been walking past some wooded lots, so I made a beeline deep into the center of them and crouched in the bush. I watched the truck inch by U-turn and repeat for over 15 minutes before they left. I walked through the woods to get to my yard. 
I later heard that a truck with the same description and two similarly described guys were wanted for an attempted kidnapping of a neighborhood girl age 11. Oh, my God. How terrifying. That's like a parent's worst nightmare. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thankfully, it was attempted. Yeah. Yeah. Not successful. Yeah. Thank God. This one is from Poutine Famine. Yeah, <laughs> they're Canadian. <laughs> I was in the lobby of the World Trade Center 1 on September 11th when the plane hit. Although I didn't know a plane had hit, what I experienced was a sound like a building bending and metal tearing. Then all of the doors in the lobby blew open and burning hot air blew into my face. And it sounds like hell was coming down those stairs. Turned out I was right. Mm. I jumped behind the lobby desk and covered my head. The explosion poured into the lobby and I could feel myself start to burn. But it eventually burned out and I was mostly okay. Then I ran out. Wow. Holy. These I are could crazy. <clears throat> yeah. And I could just like, could you even imagine what those people went through? No. That would have been absolutely horrifying. This one is from I'm not a I think. <laughs> I was helping check cows on my family's ranch. I got out there in my car just a little before dusk. The cows were all kind of scattered, so I decided to just walk in so I don't stir them up too much. Wait, did and you can say get cows? a look. Cows. Oh, I love cows. Okay, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I was checking if there was any baby calves. I'm well into the field, like a solid five minute walk from my car at least, looking around at all the cows, checking the ones that were looking kind of close on calving. I then see some of the cows furthest away from me kind of stir. So I look and see something dark and large, mm. cat-shaped, crouched low to the ground, slowly stalking some of the cows. Mm. Now, I live in West Texas, so jaguars aren't really a thing. But there had been rumors for years that these jaguars that stalked up and down the creek. That went right by our ranch. It probably was just a dark colored mountain lion, but either way, it was definitely not something I wanted to mess with in the dark, away from a vehicle with no gun. I am not ashamed to say <laughs> I left the cows to defend themselves <laughs> oh, no. and ran as fast as I could through the field back to my car. I did check the next day and all cows were safe and accounted for. <laughs> Oh, God. Which is great. <laughs> Those poor cows. I know. Just hanging out, minding their own business. Yeah. This one is from Comprehensive Soil One. Weird. These are weird names. <laughs> People are weird. <laughs> I was exploring an abandoned high rise. Out of the blue, my friend grabbed me by my collar from behind. I was about to step into an elevator shaft. After swearing at him, what the fuck, he said, look, <laughs> and I saw the drop of like 20 floors to a concrete bottom with broken metal rods sticking out. Mm. So if he had have gone in there, he would have been absolutely impaled. So. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine? Absolutely not. <sighs> Oh, I don't like this username, but I'm going to have to say it anyways. Okay. Stoned suicide. <gasps> oh. Yeah. When I was 15, I had a horrible one in a million accident that almost cost me my life and left me blind in my right eye. Oh, my gosh. All thanks to an ice cube. Oh, my gosh. I was at a friend's house about two blocks from my own with a couple of other friends with no cell phones. I was in his kitchen getting some ice, but he didn't have the ice dispensing fridges you mostly see today. Instead, he had those ice cube trays that you fill with water, freeze, then crack to get the ice out. How barbaric. <laughs> well, when I cracked it, a piece of ice flew out and ricocheted into my open right eye, <gasps> causing it to pop 
Oh, like a blood filled water balloon. Oh, my God. Horrifying. The shock must have been so bad that I passed out because I awoke to a foggy silhouette of my friend holding me for dear life as he rushed down the street from his house to mine so I didn't lose any more blood. The doctor said that if the ice cube had gone one centimeter deeper or if I had lost any more blood, then I'd be dead. Oh, my gosh. Since they had never seen a case as unique as mine, they asked me to be the subject for many med students' papers and presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I'd go to their classes where they asked me questions, did papers on me, studied my vision, and stuff like that. I'm now 27 with stage 3 glaucoma and have had 23 surgeries and around 87 stitches. Oh, my God. All from a little piece of ice. Yeah. That's crazy. Crazy. This is a username that I can't even like. It's just a bunch of letters and numbers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when I was 17, I developed an irregular ovarian cyst. It was growing pretty quickly, so my doctor scheduled a surgery to remove it. He said to come in if I felt a sharp pain, which would mean that it had burst and we could cancel the surgery. A few days later, I felt a sharp pain, so I went in for an ultrasound. It was still there, so they sent me home. A few days after that, up and about a week before my surgery, I felt it again. I'm wondering if this is like appendix. Yeah. I decided not to go in since it was the same pain I'd felt earlier. I went in for surgery the following week, and when they opened me up, they saw that not only had the cyst burst, but part of my ovary had ruptured, <gasps> and my body wasn't flushing out the fluids. Oh, gosh. I had been bleeding internally all week. <gasps> If I had gone in when I felt the pain, they would have seen that the cyst was gone and likely canceled the surgery. I then would have died either from internal bleeding of my ruptured ovary or sepsis from my body not flushing out the cyst. Oh, my God. I had a uncle. I think he was an uncle. It was like a step grandma's son who died of sepsis at like 30 something. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I hate that. Sepsis is no joke, man. It really is not. Um, <laughs> okay. This is kind of like Ashley, what she wanted to do, but without the Crocs. <laughs> the username is Rugrat from Space. Ooh, I like that one. <laughs> I was drunk at my friend's bachelorette party where we were on a river, and I decided that it would be fun to jump off the boat for some reason. Obviously, the current wasn't much. Oh, obviously, the current was much, much stronger than my dumb, drunk ass realized. I caught a branch and figured out at that moment that I had made a very grave mistake and was just holding on for dear life, trying not to go under. I still remember to this day, three years later, even with how drunk I was, the exact thoughts going through my head. I'm going to drown because I'm drunk and my parents and friends are going to be pissed at me. <laughs> <laughs> my friends were not happy with me when I got back on the boat. I'm sober now. And if you have done something like this while drinking, it might be a sign to reevaluate your relationship with alcohol. <laughs> and this is one last one that I will do. Okay. This one is from Jill Gould. A friend and I went to see the Northern Lights in Iceland, Ashley's favorite place. I love Iceland. It was close to midnight and pitch black. When we stepped off the tourist bus, our guide warned us to stay close and make sure that our eyes adjusted to the darkness. Yeah. I stepped on a rock as I got off the bus and thought that I should kick it out of the way for the people behind me. As I was kicking the rock over and telling people to be careful... Oh, no. I fell down a black Icelandic rock ravine. <gasps> I didn't go as far as it felt, but while I was tumbling down, I thought that I was a goner because I couldn't see anything around me and everything was spinning. Luckily, my friend was behind me and said that I basically just <laughs> disappeared out of the light. <laughs> Oh, no. Imagine just like your friends are and all of a sudden <laughs> whoop, gone. 
Another person on our trip saw me vanish, turned on his phone light, and was able to help me back up the hill. I only had a few scrapes and a jammed finger, but I don't think the tour bus driver even knew how close he was to a drop-off. Oh, my God. The moral of the story is always listen to your tour guide. <laughs> yes. Speaking of, yeah. did you hear about um, this U.S. soldier was on a tour of the North Korean South Korean border? And he decided for some reason to run into North Korea and got arrested. <gasps> yeah. Why would you do that? He's like 18 to 20 ish. Uh, so just like probably being a dumb kid. And now he's like, uh, I'm worried for him. Yeah. No kidding. <sighs> um, well, those were great. I loved those. Thanks. Uh, I have some jokes too. Okay. Okay. A pair of cows were talking in the field. Mm. One says, have you heard about the mad cow disease that's going around? Oh, no. The other cow said, yeah, makes me so glad that I'm a penguin. <laughs> I love that one so much. <laughs> This other one is from 1950, I think, is what that means. It says, once my father came home and found me in front of a roaring fire. That made my father very mad as we didn't have a fireplace. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's awful. <laughs> Some of the 1950s. <laughs> <laughs> this one's from December 1987. Your mother has been with us for 20 years, said John. Isn't it time she got a place of her own? My mother, replied Helen. I thought she was your mother. <laughs> so That's an incest <laughs> joke. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Ew. I like how you didn't get it. <laughs> and then one last one. Around it all up. <laughs> Why don't pirates take a shower before they walk the plank? I don't know why. They just wash up on shore. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that one. My favorite was the cow one. That was yeah. my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> the cat one was really good <laughs> well if you want more of us lovely ladies you can find us on a facebook instagram tiktok and patreon and youtube and youtube we're so many places we're everywhere guys <laughs> and if you would like to rate and review us you can do so on spotify and apple podcast thanks for tuning in and we look forward to bringing you two new stories next week bye, bye.